Good day to you. This is Evangelist Bill Randall with Restoring Hope 365 Ministries. I'm going to continue the series that's called, How Confident Are You in the Bible That You Use? Today we're going to be going with part five of the series, and we're going to talk about key individuals uh, who are responsible for turning a different emphasis on scripture. Uh, their names are Westcott and Hort. And this is going to be uh, pretty significant, so uh, I hope it's enlightening. Bishop Brooke Foss Westcott and Professor Fenton John Anthony Hort were individuals who were members of the Church of England. They were members of that church, but they really did not believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. Even though they were members of the Church of England, and even though they, on the surface, seem to subscribe to the notion that scripture, scripture is inerrant, they had a disdain for Scripture. They really did. You can go and review some of their writings and see that uh, they did not believe the Bible was true in the sense that uh, those who subscribe to the uh, validity of Scripture uh, do. Westcott and Hort did not believe in the true validity of Scripture. Professor Hort believed in evolution. As a matter of fact, he felt that evolution, in his words, came from God. Now, you had uh, Charles Darwin was uh, bringing forth the theory of evolution along with many others who had uh, similar notions. And uh, Hort jumped right on that, and he felt it was valid. He also believed that people could work for their salvation. Hort believed in Christian socialism, that everyone should create a society that ends poverty and everybody should, you should take from certain groups and give to others so that no one has poverty. They based their writings on texts that were taken from the Alexandrian, Vaticanus, and Sinaiticus versions of scripture. These were versions that actually were discarded in a room in northern Egypt, near Alexandria, Egypt. They had not been in circulation. They were out of circulation and uh, when, it was, when they were examined they were found to have over 3,000 textual errors in what was written in them. So they were not accepted at all. Meanwhile, in the area of Antioch near Syria, you had over 5,000 scrolls in Greek that when you compared one with the other, they were in complete agreement. Five thousand scrolls, when compared, were virtually identical, and they came to be known as the Textus Receptus, or the text that was received. And the basis of the uh, Eng modern English Bible was when Erasmus, Erasmus uh, used the scrolls, he translated them directly into Latin, and he did not use the Latin Vulgate of the Catholic Church. And then after he translated the uh, Greek scrolls into Latin, then others took, and in the previous uh, videos, you could go back and look at them, they translated them into English, and the uh, church at Rome was very furious, and even... Uh, burned at the stake individuals who were responsible for translating it into English. But Westcott and Hort, despite the fact that they were going against the authorized version or the King James Version, they did acknowledge that the authorized version is equal in antiquity to the Alexandrian scrolls. Now, antiquity is just speaking of times that were in ancient days, particularly those days before the Middle Ages. 
and they acknowledged that yes, the uh, Textus Receptus was in fact uh, as old as the ones they were using with the Alexandrian, Sinaiticus, and Vaticanus uh, versions. But these versions, like I said before, had many errors in them, and when they went to compile the King James Version, they were not accepted. Westcott and Hort sought to resurrect the Alexandrian, Sinaiticus, and Vaticanus texts, and they were the basis of his modern versions, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. But you'll find that there, there's a significant difference between what Westcott and Hort used and what was in the King James. A Hort is quoted as saying, I do not see how man's sin can be paid for by the atonement of one man, Jesus, without each man suffering and paying in full for his own sin. Now, this is a man who formulated an approach that's the springboard for the modern day versions. Uh, Westcott and Hort use vernacular, uh, but fundamentally oppose this meaning, meaning that they did use the term Trinity and they did use the term, uh, you know, inerrant, but they meant it in a different context. For example, Trinity now is not talking to them, was not talking about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It was talking about different aspects of God, God's holiness, you know, God's omniscience, and, you know, they, they substituted different terms, but that's how they termed Trinity. Professor Hort's son, in a writing that he made, he spoke of his grandmother's, which is Hort's, which is Professor Hort's mother, uh, what happened one time. She was an evangelical, and Hort's writings formed a rift between her and her son. She knew about his writing about evolution, Christian socialism, and et cetera, et cetera, and the mother didn't buy into it. She felt that it was heretical, and he was estranged from his own mother because of his writings. Professor Hort made the statement, I outgrew evangelicalism. Westcott and Hort believed that the Bible should not be treated any differently than Plato, Shakespeare, Charles Dickens, etc. Hort said, in the New Testament corruptions by interpolation, they are many times more numerous than corruptions by omissions. Hort went on to say, if you make a decided conviction of the infallibility of the New Testament, I could not join you. I am not able to assert the absolute infallibility of canonical writing, writings of canon, of scripture. I cannot say that it's inerrant. Hort spoke about man atoning for his sin through purgatory. Hort said, eternity is independent of duration. In other words, there's no such thing as uh, burning in hell forever and ever. It's independent of duration. We know that the Bible says the smoke of their torment rose forever and ever. He also said, the power of repentance is not limited to this life. In other words, you could die and then be in purgatory and repent there and get yourself out of hell. And he also said that it is not revealed whether or not all will ultimately repent, those that go to purgatory. Hort said, certainly nothing can be more unscriptural than the modern limitation of Christ's bearing our sins and suffering to his death. It is only one aspect of an almost universal heresy. Hort believed that the atonement of Christ dying for our sins was heresy. But yet, these men helped form the foundation for many modern translations. Hort wrote in a letter to Westcott, on April 28, 1865, he said, with respect to America, I have a hatred of democracy in all its forms. He went on to say, I have made up my mind to devote my three to four years up here to the study of the subject of communism. 
Westcott said, no one now holds that the first three chapters of Genesis give a literal history. Westcott also said, I never read an account of a miracle, but where I seem to instinctively feel its improbability. Westcott and Hort rejected the 5,000 plus copies of the received text found in Syria and Antioch. Instead, they used the Alexandrian, Sinaiticus, and Vaticanus versions, which were 40 to 50 in number, and they had over 3,000 textual errors. And I mentioned earlier how they say, well, it's older. Yeah, it's older, all right. Older because it was out of circulation and no one was using them. Whereas the other scriptures, the Greek manuscripts, had been used over and over and over and over and over. And when they outlived their uh, life, they're copied, and you make a new scroll. So, of course, a new scroll, age-wise, is not going to be as old as something that's been sitting there for a few hundred years. Westcott and Hort finally published their Bible called the Revised Standard Version of the King James. And then other versions followed that used Westcott and Hort's foundation for their text. The American Standard Version, the Revised American Standard Version, and others. The New International Version wasn't published until 1978. But an interesting thing about the uh, versions that are published using Westcott and Hort, they're copyrighted. And in order to get a new printing and a copyright on it, it has to have at least 10% difference from the other version. Isn't that interesting? You've got to have 10% difference. You have to have a 10% difference in what was previously printed in order to officially copyright something and revise it. For those that don't believe that this is a serious thing about the use of Westcott and Hort's manuscripts, listen to this. In 1964, Jacob Greenlee stated, the textual theory of Westcott and Hort underlies virtually all subsequent work in New Testament textual criticism. In other words, Westcott and Hort's writings have permeated virtually all of the new translations. Ernest Caldwell said, C-O-L-W-E-L-L, -E -L -L, he said, Hort did not fail to reach his majority goal, which is dethroning the Texas Receptus. I heard a minister once say, Satan doesn't have any new tricks. He just has new faces. The word of God tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness and high places. They will put on religious cloaks. They will be members of Bible colleges. They will be members of churches. And their end game, their end goal is to kill, steal, and destroy. They lie because their father, the devil, lies. The word of God says the devil is the father of lies. Now, I am not saying that anyone who uses a version other than King James is off their rocker. As a matter of fact, my position is quite different. I actually believe that there are some uh, points in the King James where other translations can be very helpful in bringing the modern vernacular, the modern speech, the modern sayings uh, to light as compared to the King James. Some of the old English in the King James may not be as easily understood as modern words. So if you were to parallel what's in modern translations with what's in the King James, it could very well be very helpful in understanding the text. 
but it would be a mistake to just ditch the King James and take the modern translation on face value because the basis of modern translations is the work done by Westcott and Hort. So even though a good portion of what was done, the work was done by Westcott and Hort is fairly solid, It is not something to go to the bank on. Every word of God is true. It's pure. The word tells us that holy men of God wrote scripture as they were moved and led to do so by the Holy Spirit. All 66 books were inspired by the Almighty. And holy men of God allowed the Spirit of God to lead them in what to write. The Old Testament in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek, all God breathed. 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. Psalm 119 verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It's settled. He's not looking to make a change to it or a modern-day consideration. Just like many who are liberal today say that uh, many lifestyles that people are into, God knows, God sees, God understands, and saying, well, if you're in a monogamous relationship and love each other, God understands. God is not going around changing his mind on what his word said. Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled. If you go back to a story in the Old Testament, uh, Moses had displeased God when God had told him to speak to the rock and the water would come forth for the people to get the water. Moses was angry at the people, and he let his anger get the best of him. And he hit, he took a rod and hit the rock. Bam, bam. Shall I fetch this water for you people? So he hit the rock, and God, in his mercy, still let the water come out. But Moses dishonored the Lord by that action, letting his anger get the best of him. What did it cost Moses? It cost him the right to go into the promised land. Now Moses was a mighty man of God. He was God's man. But when he blatantly went against Almighty God, God said, you dishonored me before the people. So you're not going to get to enter in. Now God allowed him to go to a high elevation and look over the land to see where the children of Israel were going to go. But Moses himself was not going to go in there. Moses later on asked the Lord, could he go in? God again told him, you're not going to go in. And get this, he said, speak to me no more about this matter. Moses came back and asked God, God, can I, can I go in? He, he didn't say those words, but to that effect, am I going to be able to go in? God said, essentially, no, and don't bring up the subject again. When God penned what he penned in Scripture, in those 66 books, he's not looking at modern times and saying, well, I think I'll change this because, you know, I want them to be able to deal with this. No. Psalm 119, 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And we need to take seriously this matter of changing scripture. Taking scripture out. 
replacing it with something that it doesn't say. You're on dangerous ground when you do that. Dangerous ground. So this lesson, this message is very important, and I would encourage you to maybe replay it and then share it with others because it's an important issue. The next one that we get into, I'm going to show you uh, in even more detail how dangerous it is and how Scripture can be changed and twisted and manipulated. For some, it may be very eye-opening. But we're going to end this uh, message right here. And uh, I thank you for your attention. Now, I ask you to go to my website, restoringhope365.com, restoringhope365.com. There you'll find information about me, Evangelist Bill Randall. If your pastor, your church wants me to come and minister as an evangelist, please go to my website. There are forms you can fill out and send to me. I will prayerfully consider each and every request that's sent. As I mentioned before, I am not going to blanketly go to every place that requests that I come. If a church does not believe in the validity of Scripture, or their beliefs are incongruent with the faith, I cannot in good conscience go there and minister. For that, I make no apology. I'm not trying to be mean-spirited. That's just the way it is. But if your church does believe foundational bedrock principles, I believe I'd be more than happy to come out and minister as the Lord leads. If you feel led to make a contribution to this ministry, and we do appreciate your contributions, uh, you can make it at the website restoringhope365.com. You'll find a secure portal there for you to make a tax-deductible contribution to this ministry. But whether you are able to give an offering to this ministry or not, please pray for Brother Bill. Pray for uh, the Lord leading me, preparing my heart. Uh, pray for all of the opportunities that he would have me to uh, fill. And uh, keep us in your prayer because, you know, all ministries today are coming under attack in various forms. If you do not know Jesus as your Savior, what better time would there be than right now? To solidify that decision. If you're not sure whether or not you're a Christian, you can't gamble with something like your soul. Get it settled. Salvation comes from repentance, saying, Lord, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I acknowledge that I've been going my way, and I repent of that way, and I receive Jesus as my Savior, and I want him to be the Lord of my life. Jesus paid it all when he died, was crucified by sinful man, was buried. The Holy Spirit gave witness to the fact that he was the Son of God and rose. he rose from the dead. And now he is seated at the right hand of the Father, having paid for our sins. Now, Westcott and Hort didn't believe that. They didn't believe that Jesus could make atonement for our sins. But you and I can make that decision and say, by faith, I believe that God put on an earth suit and died for my sins and was raised from the dead. And he's living today. And I want him to be the Lord of my life. If that's you, let's say this prayer. Dear Father, thank you for your blessings. I know I'm a sinner. I confess it. Your word says, if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that you have raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Thank you for saving me, Lord. Even though I don't understand everything, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to get with believers and learn more about the Bible. I'm going to download a Bible app so I can start reading your word. And I'm going to get in fellowship with other Christians so I can grow in the faith. Amen. God bless you if you made that decision. If you uh, would like to correspond, you can send us an email, info at restoringhope365.com. Now I'm going to close as I typically do in the book of Jude. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, 
To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. God bless you as you walk with the King.